Hello everyone and a warm welcome to online events. We're here for couples therapy. Do one-to-one -one therapists need extra training to work with couples? With Juliet Grayson. Juliet, a warm welcome back to online events. Lovely to see you again, John. Great to have you with us. And I know so all the colleagues who are joining us live here in Zoom and on Facebook. And if you're watching the recording in the library, great to have you with us too. Yeah. By way of a, a reintroduction, Juliet, and for colleagues who haven't met you yet, could you say a little bit about the work that you're doing? I know you do lots of things, so just to yeah. get that, that would be great. I have a few kind of strands. So uh, mostly I think of myself as a relationship and sex therapist. So I'm a psychosexual therapist. Um, I got my UKCP accreditation in 1994, um, having done a lot of NLP and then a... Um, a, we, I did a, what they called a professional counselling course before that. Then I did the NLP um, because I thought that the counselling actually didn't give me enough skills, so I wanted more skills. And then I had a couple who came, and I decided I'd work with them, as I think a lot of one-to-one -one therapists decide. But I realised as I was working with them that there's more to this than meets the eye. And so I looked, and there was a a weekend training and I thought I'd go along and try that out and it was fantastic and I loved it it was with a woman called Daphne Boddington and she was a trainer at the Maudsley Hospital and so I found myself signing up for a two-year course at the Maudsley which was um, the first year was relationships and the second year was sexual problems and that was a very rigorous course in the morning we would have lectures and then in the afternoon we would have clinic and the clinic was run by the students, but there was a one-way screen, and behind the screen would be a team of people, um, sometimes up to 20 or 25 people squeezed in a little room, sometimes just one or two. And there would be a telephone into the room where I was working with clients, and they, if they didn't like what you were doing, they'd ring up and say, you know, can you ask this question, or can you do that, or can you... So they'd kind of steer you in different directions, which was, you know, it was a very rigorous training. It was fantastic in many ways. Um, and, and the training had been designed by Jane Ridley and Michael Crow, Dr. Michael Crow, and um, they called it a behavioral systemic training. So um, I did that. And really now, in terms of my clinic at home, my focus is relationship problems and sexual problems and, and I don't really see anyone who doesn't um, have one of those you know either a relationship or a sexual problem very occasionally someone slips through the net but I try to um, uh, send the others off to other people and then I came across another methodology which is the Pesso Boyden system of psychotherapy which you and I are going to be talking about in a week's time so I won't say too much about that now, but I just love that and I find that the most effective method. So for me, the best thing is when I see a couple, two and me doing couple therapy, and then they also go along to one of the Pesso Boyden group, groups that I run, because I've got five of those up and down the country. Um, so they join in a group as well, because that really heals the early um, childhood issues that of course play out in our couple relationships. So for me as a therapist, I love it when people can afford to and have the time to and the resources to do both the, the work individually with me or as a couple with me and the group work that's really going to do the early healing. So, so that's kind of what I do. Then there's just a little in my spare time, I set up a charity called Stop So, which works with sex offenders. So we have a UK-wide network now of therapists who are trained to work with anyone who feels at risk of committing a sexual offence. And our aim there is predominantly to stop the first crime. So to, to, to remove sexual abuse completely would be our aim. It's never going to happen, but that's the aim. Yeah. But we also work with people who've committed offences as well. And, um, but, but offering them therapy in the community that hopefully before they um, act out um, or before they re-offend, we can help them to stop. And that way, we're stopping people from becoming victims. So that's the aim of that is, is let's pick up the pieces after it's happened. Let's go upstream and, and stop it before. So, Yeah, important work. And a yeah. busy, that gives you every week's a busy week for you, Julia. Yes. There's always something going on. Yes. 
yes, yeah. And the, I noticed I was looking at your website last week. When you're working with couples, you can do that quite intensively, like for long yeah. Could you say a little bit about that, please? So I have two ways of working. One is that for local people, they come and they do an hour or an hour and a half at a time. They also offer another model, which we call Couples in Calamity, which is where they come for seven hours over two days. So they come for an afternoon, three and a half hours, one afternoon in a, in a block, and then three and a half hours the next morning in a block, and they stay overnight locally somewhere. So that's really useful for people who um, uh, don't live locally but want to really sort something out. And you can do a good bit of work in seven hours. So, so it's often enough to really kind of move things forward or help a couple decide whether to stay together or not or whatever their issue is. Um, it, it, it's a great way to, uh, to kind of really um, give a dynamic boost to the system, let's put it that way. Mm. Yes. Yeah, and if, you, in, if the couple is also doing the Pesoboidin method, because I, you invited me to join a couple of groups last week, which I did, and it was incredible just to see the impact on early trauma so quickly. So I, it makes sense to me, the couples doing that work, plus they could come and do that intensive piece yeah. of Yeah, 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 yeah. So that works very well. And, and one of the things I do is that I run, well, me and a team. So actually, I don't run so many of them these days. I'm doing one in November in Western Supermare. But we run a six modular program, which I designed, because it's hard to find a way to move from being a one-to-one -one therapist to being able to work with couples. And I realized that, um, well, really, I had something to offer in, order, in, in, in terms of teaching people. And so I created this 12-day program, six modules, which is, um, covers various different topics. So the first one is, we call it the fundamentals of working with couples. And I say the first one because it logically makes sense to do the fundamentals first, but actually it doesn't matter what sequence you take them in. So people can do them in any old order. So there's the fundamentals of working with couples. There's communication and difference. Then sex, arousal and aging. Meeting their partner's needs, which is about early attachment issues. Um, couples and conflict, which covers sort of domestic violence and the difference between anger and rage and dealing with affairs because affairs are, you know, a common issue that crop up in couple therapy. So what I thought would be useful today is just to talk a little bit about some of the models that we use on those modules, because I think that will give people a flavor you know, many people watching this won't want to come and do the training. That's absolutely fine. Um, uh, so it'll give them enough to have a taste of, of something that they may be able to take away and use later. And some people may say, yeah, actually, this sounds interesting and I, I, I want to do the training. I think the skill of working with couples is different from working one to one. And um, certainly one of the things I notice is that as I'm teaching people how to work with couples and be a couple therapist, I need to help them be able to hold the space in a slightly different way. So in one-to-one -one therapy, we're more polite and we're more um, hesitant and we wait for a time when we're allowed to speak back to the client. You know, there's kind of, in couple therapy, Sometimes you've got a warring couple in front of you. Sometimes they're in the middle of a row, furious with, her, with each other, and there needs to be a, a, a stronger holding. And the couple really, the, the therapist really needs to learn how to tap into their own sense of their authority and bring that into the room because that's what makes the couple feel safer. So if, if the therapist is too um, delicate, polite, the word I want to use is namby pamby, but forgive me. <laughs> um, you know, if, 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 if you're too soft, then it may be that the couple won't feel safe enough to really keep engaging. So there's, there's a certain authority that as a couple therapist, one needs to engage. And, and it's definitely more directive than a lot of one-to-one -one therapy is. Um, so, so yeah, I think it is a different, 
a different skill and, and some people come and do my my you know just one module or two modules of my course they you can you can take them in any order and in any sequence and if you do all six of them you get a certificate in couple therapy but if you just want to pick up one or two for some people that's enough and they stop there and that's okay but many people realize that actually this is quite a complex field and having two people in the room is a different ball game from having one client in the room. Um, especially if one of them is upsetting the other one or saying something hurtful or, you know, it, it requires a, what, how would I put it? It requires a, a strength, a holding, I've said that already, um, a willingness to get in there, a willingness to get stuck in, a willingness to, I think as a couple therapist, I, one of the things I bring is really helping them to be honest with each other. And, and, and the deeper level of honesty, which means that they need to be honest with themselves first. And of course, we're not all honest with ourselves. Yeah. So trying to help them get to a deeper level of honesty, which rebuilds the trust and rebuilds the respect, which obviously by the time they come to us may well have diminished. Um, I think most couples come probably two or three years later than they should for couple therapy. And definitely for sex therapy, that's true. It's three or four years. They know they've had a problem for a while and they, they hope it's going to go away or get better. And they put off and put off and put off coming and getting help. And actually, if we could encourage them to come sooner to get help, it means that their problems are less entrenched. So... Um, and... Like a lot of us spend a lot of time training to offer one-to-one -one therapy, to not be directive, to be gentle and careful. <laughs> <laughs> How do you help colleagues then to get that more robust frame holding and, and maybe more direct communication? Like, do you have a sense of how you can help? Wow. Yes. Yeah, so on our, on our workshops, we do little role plays. So there'll be 15 or 30 minute role plays where there's one therapist and the two other therapists are role playing a couple. To be honest, the way those people treat each other is appalling and no one would ever be as bad as that. <laughs> okay. So okay. for the therapist who's trying to manage this couple dynamic, it's a really good way of um, whether you can manage what's going to really come into a therapy room. And it's just a question of raising people's awareness. And for some people, they go, oh, goody, goody, you know, that's fantastic. Finally, I can let my directive bossy side out. And other people find it harder and have to draw on something on the inside. And, you know, a posture has a lot to do with it. Breathing has a lot to do with it. And having a sense of confidence yet if they come and do you know, three, four, five, or all six of the modules, they get a sense of confidence. And, um, and, and, and it seems to work. They seem to be able to kind of draw on that aspect of themselves. Yeah, yeah. So like we may, may be emphasizing a different part of our personality or a yeah. character that, yeah. Yeah, yeah, that maybe for some of us actually has went undeveloped in the one-to-one -one part. Like we might have that bossy, powerful part that's saying, right, okay, I'm yeah. the boss here, or at exactly. least for some of that. Exactly, exactly. And, you know, there's something really wonderful about working with a couple and helping them to get their relationship back on track. You know, it's incredibly rewarding work, especially when you think that there may well be little people involved in the family as well. You know, they may have children who are suffering because of the tensions in the relationship or the threat of divorce and separation. And... You know, by helping them to get a more harmonious relationship, by helping them to get it back on track, you know, it's, it, it can be deeply moving and, and deeply rewarding work. And also, um, financially, it's good because it increases your client base. So, um, you know, it, it, it means that there's a whole other section of work that opens up to you that as an individual therapist isn't available to you. Um, and I don't know about other... Um, member organizations of UKCP, but I know that NLP, for example, the NLPTCA, which is the Neurolinguistic Psychotherapy and Counseling Association, they require specialist training if you're going to work with couples. 
And I think more and more member organizations are, are recognizing that this is a different skill and it behoves us to skill up um, and be ready for them. Um, the other thing I hear is, of course, that even in one-to-one -one therapy, most clients bring relationship issues. So the topics that get covered are really beneficial for people in their one-to-one -one therapy. And also, and we don't really publicize this, but really beneficial for their own relationships. Uh, yes. A lot of people who after the courses say, oh, I took that back and it was really helpful. Or we, I did this exercise with my husband and it was, you know, very illuminating. And so I get a lot of feedback from people who attend the workshops, but the information they've got has actually helped them in their lives and their cause, you know, their, their relationships. So, well, that's a great selling point too, Julia. <laughs> Not yeah. just for the clients, but for us too. And in fact, there's a comment just came in on Facebook where a colleague saying, I've done two of the six modules, which were brilliant. So that's, oh, that's great nice. feedback. So Thank lovely. you. <laughs> and also coming with a question. Yes, yeah, so that's very good news. Um, what are the differences in contracting with couples from working with one client? So, the, yeah, there's a, do you contract differently with a couple? There's, in some ways, yes, in some ways, no. So, so I would say the actual literal contract is, um, uh, is the same, but there are a lot of things for you to think about. So one thing is that the couple are going to try, each, each member of the couple is likely to try to get you to like them best or to decide that they're right. So people really love being right. They really love being the one, the favorite. So as a couple therapist, you have to be very careful about how much time you spend working on one compared to how much time you spend working on the other. I'm very clear when I think someone's behavior is inappropriate or unacceptable. I don't not say that, but you then have to balance that up and make sure that you find something in the other person that either you criticize or something you can bless so that you need to be aware that in a way we take on a sort of parental role and you need to treat the children equally is one way of thinking about it or, or I, I, you know, in a way I don't like that because it puts, it, it implies that I'm putting them down and me up. I'm the expert on working with relationships and that's, that's the truth, but they're the expert on their relationship and how it works and how it doesn't work. So I don't think of myself as one up to them, but I do think of myself as the holder of the space the person who takes the authority for that hour or hour and a half. Um, so there are a number of things, for instance, for anyone who's relatively new to working with couples, I wouldn't see one person for a long time first and then allow them to bring their partner in and start working with them as a couple because you've built a relationship with one person too strongly and the other person is probably likely to feel left out, is probably going to be hard. So, so if I've seen one person for one session or two sessions, then I'll say, well, let me see your partner for one or two sessions on their own, and then we'll start the couple therapy. So that can work fine. Um, but you need to be aware of that favoritism and all of those kind of dynamics that are going to be in the room. Um, and so I quite often will work with the couple and send them each off for individual therapy to a separate therapist. Um, so, so you know, there'll be three of us involved in the end, one for her, one for him, if we're going stereotypical and talking about a straight couple, and then me doing the couple therapy. And I really love it when the two other therapists will um, talk to me and we do peer supervision with the client's agreement, because it can be incredibly illuminating to hear what, and so I'm thinking now of a couple who I was working with um, and she, in her one-to-one -one therapy, was talking about him being mildly abusive and saying things that simply never came out in the couple therapy and didn't come out in his therapy. So we could bring that into our um, shared um, experience and knowledge and, and work with that explicitly. Um, so with the client's permission, being able to do three-way supervision, I think is really rich. And really speeds up the process for the couple as well. 
Um, so that could be part of the contracting that you do yeah. that for the three therapists to talk together and yeah. and then you might bring something back into the couples therapy that has been in the one-to-one therapy but you is there a chance you might give like one partner a fright like oh I didn't want to say that here or well so you need to get very clear so that's another difference in contracting so when I was training at the Maudsley, they never let us see clients on a one-to-one. We only ever saw them as a couple. And I remember one guy, because it was um, NHS, an NHS clinic, I remember one chap who used to travel down from North Wales with his wife, and one session she couldn't come. So he came all the way from North Wales to, to South London for a session, and they turned him around at the door because she was ill and hadn't come and they wouldn't, they wouldn't let us see him one to one. So they were very clear. The contract was, I see you as a couple, that's it. I never see you on your own. My contract is different. Now that I've been doing this for, you know, a couple of decades, I um, do see people for one to one sessions and I find it very useful to find out the underlying truth of what's going on. So I do that and I agree to hold confidentiality. Um, But that's really complex because, for example, the couple where I knew that he had had an affair that was ongoing and she thought it was a one-night stand, and she says in the room, if I thought this had gone on for more than one night, I would leave him, and I'm sitting there knowing that it did. That's really tough. That's a really difficult call for a therapist to make. And I really wouldn't suggest that people offer that unless they are really experienced in holding couples and have been for quite a long time. Mm. The way of doing it is that you say, well, I will see you individually, um, but I won't hold anything confidential. So anything you tell me, I will assume I can tell your partner. So you be aware of that. And no, you take responsibility for what you talk about and if you talk about something, there's a chance I'll bring it back into the relationship. So um, different, different possibilities for contracting. One is where you only ever see them as a couple. One is where you see them as a couple and occasionally for individual sessions, but you say, I won't hold confidentiality. In other words, I will, tell, I will feel free to tell your partner anything that you tell me. And then the third one is what I currently do, which is I see them... As a couple, I see them individually, and I will hold confidentiality. Yeah, so those are the different kind of contracts that you can make. And if you're working with them in group in the Pesso Boyden method, then that confidentiality is going to be shared because they're going to see each other yeah. doing the work within yeah. the group. Yeah, and that's incredibly powerful. It's very moving for people to see their partner. You know, they might arrive really frustrated and fed up and pissed off with their partner, and then they see them doing some work, and they realize that the issue that they thought was about them is actually much more related to something, you know, in their early history. So there's a, there's a frustration between the two of them, and there's resentment built up because maybe she says, you know, he never appreciates me for what I do, and then in the Pessa Boyden work, we realized that actually her parents were never proud of her and never acknowledged her. And she used to do a lot for the family because there were um, younger siblings and never got appreciated for that. And, and suddenly the partner goes, oh, it's not all about me, you know, and, and, and it, it releases something. So that can be very healing for couples too, to realize that not everything that they thought was to do with them is actually to do with them some of it some of it goes back earlier yeah yeah very very powerful for the couple to realize mm-hmm. that um we've got a question coming through zoom wondering about three-way supervision work when there's domestic abuse in the couple and i guess that well domestic abuse in any couple's work can be difficult to work with. Yes, it it, it depends on the level of domestic abuse. I think Relate have a policy where they won't work with people where there's domestic violence going on. Um, To me, that seems quite tough because then you're just sort of abandoning them, um, uh, you know, to their own struggles without offering any support. So do keep working with people if there's domestic violence. Um, 
I would definitely be sending them off to very experienced one-to-one -one therapists if they were having separate one-to-one -one therapy. Um, and you have to be very careful because what can happen is that, let's go stereotypical and, and assume that it's the woman who's being um, beaten, let's say, by, by her husband in some way, um, or, or abused, emotionally abused in some way. You know, she may fear that anything she says in the room, when they go back out, um, that, that he'll then give her a hard time, beat her up, or, 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 or persecute her for what she said during the session. So that's very delicate work um, and, and very challenging and needs to be managed very, very carefully. So it may be that there will be a contract of confidentiality and then the therapists really have to so, so what, what, what the, so I've been in a situation where the woman, in, it was a woman in that situation, and, and don't forget, it's quite often women who are attacking men. It's not always, but, but this one was a woman who was a victim. And she had a contract with her one-to-one -one therapist. That there was something she would tell her that this person wouldn't bring to the three-way supervision. And so she held that. Her, her therapist had enough experience to be able to manage that contract. So these are complexities. Mm. You know, you certainly wouldn't want to get into that if you were a new to working with couples therapist. Um, yeah. yeah. I, I think that's really helpful to get a sense of the complexity that we need to hold in yes. that and, and yes. that there's not just one, one rule, one size fits all. It's Absolutely like, not. what does this couple need and yes. what do they need from everyone in that? Yes. That's right. That's right. That's right. That's right. And what I also do sometimes is I'll do, I'll be the only therapist and I'll work with him and she'll agree to be in the room but keep quiet while I work with him for a session. So three quarters of a, of a session is one-to-one -one work um, and just a quarter of it is kind of couple work um, and she doesn't intervene. And then the next session, he keeps quiet and I do one-to-one -one work with her but he's in the room so he can witness it. And then the third session, I do couple work with both of them and kind of bring it all together again. So that can be a powerful way of working. There are lots of different ways of working. You just need to get really clear about what you're able and willing to offer and what your boundaries are around the confidentiality. Yes, yeah, like that clarity is really important. And it, it sounds like the more experience you've got, Juliet, the more diversity you can offer. Yes, I, I mean, I feel I suppose now I take more risks. So something that if I had a new supervisee who was new to couple work, I'd say, no, I wouldn't do that. But I now do. And sometimes I get my fingers burnt and I think, oh, I realize why those boundaries should be there. And I don't do that again, you know. So, um, yeah. Um, but I would say if you're, if you're a newer therapist or newer to couple therapy, the contract should be that you're not going to hold any secrets and um, that everything that they say you can talk to the partner about um, because that's the simplest contract and it's the least complex. So that would be what I'd go for. Yeah. Thank you for that clarity, Julia. That's really helpful, especially if we're thinking about starting coming into this work. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Another question from a colleague. Um, saying there seems to be a high element of coaching in what you're describing, would you? Yeah, you could call it coaching. Yeah, that would be a way of describing it. Um, it's solution focused. It's proactive. It's, I often give them homework, so they go away with something that they have to do. I try and make the homework simple enough that they're actually going to do it um, because I don't want to breed sort of a sense of failure. Um, and it's incredibly hard for couples to find time. So even saying, I want you to sit down and talk to each other for 10 minutes, three times a week, you know, it's very hard for them to find the time to do that. Sometimes in the session, we'll do a little bit of practice negotiation. A lot of couples are very bad at negotiating with one another. So I'll help them learn how to ask for something. So that's about helping them ask for something that they actually want. So not what they don't want. So it's not you know, I don't want you to look at me like that anymore. It's I want to hug when I come home from work. So something proactive that they want, something small and achievable. And um, uh, learning how to be able to 
feel that there's something I want and I have a right to ask for it um, and, and something that's achievable for the other person to do. So all of those are little negotiating skill tricks that I teach them and then they do a live negotiation and then they go off and so it might be that one of them has agreed that they're going to give a hug every day when they come home from work and the other one has agreed that they're going to cook supper once a week. Um, so I have to check, it. does this feel like it's balanced? You know, is cooking supper once a week equivalent to a hug every day? You know, so all these things I'm, I'm processing and um, checking whether I feel it's balanced. Although what's most important is that the couple feels it's balanced. Um, yeah. So, so here's a skill that I learned in the Pesaboiden that is really useful, which is what we call micro-tracking, which is the reading of how invested someone is or isn't in what we've just discussed. So I'm looking for those little facial micromuscular um, giveaways that let me know that someone isn't quite bought into this or they're frustrated about this or they're pissed off about this. And I will bring those up to the surface. So the surface, the underlying feelings and thoughts and um, skepticism <coughs> that might be going on. Um, could so, you give us some examples of that, of micro-tracking? Like... So, um, you're looking puzzled right now. Okay, yes. Um, so, if I had just explained something and there was a look of puzzlement on someone's face, I, I might say to her, you know, do you notice how puzzled he is about that right now? Um, or another thing, something that I'm constant, not constantly, but frequently, um, keeping an antenna out is for when there are loving messages or loving glances being delivered and the partner doesn't notice. So quite often one will be, this may be not in the first few sessions, but you know, maybe in sessions sort of four to six or eight or something, the love is beginning to come back in, the respect is beginning to come back in. And I'll say, did you notice how he looked at you when you said that? And she'll go, no, what, what, you know. And probably get a bit defensive when I'll say he was really looking at you in a loving way when you said that mm. and then he'll nod like you're nodding now because he recognizes it yes yes the nod and and so what I'm doing is I'm teaching them to read each other more effectively couples often do what we call mind reading where they fantasize what the other one's thinking and they may or may not be correct and I'm wanting to help them read more accurately and then check out was that true I thought I saw you getting angry were you angry in that moment? So that they check out more and they do less of that mind reading stuff. Yes, that can be so impactful for a couple. That I'm very good at that mind reading thing where I go, I know exactly what you're thinking and it's completely wrong. And yeah, that's right, that's right. The whole story erupts for no reason yes, at all. Yes, exactly, exactly, yeah. exactly. Mm. Yeah, so you're starting to catch those changes that are happening within the relationship, within the kind of like the body communication and making sure they both hear that sounds really yes and i think that's another aspect is really helping them to clock the changes that are happening mm. you know if they for instance if they disagree about 90 percent of what's going on i'll find the 10 percent that they agree on and i'll see if i can make that 12 percent and then 15 percent so and 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 where there's progress when they come back in next week and they go oh it's been terrible this week you know a frequent one. It's been terrible this week. Um, we've just been, you know, I, uh, three times this week. I've I've told him what I think, and he wasn't listening, and 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 he didn't. And I said, "Fantastic! You were able to tell him what you think. That's amazing. Two weeks ago, you couldn't do that. That's a real step forward. Well done. Now, what we need to do is help him know how to let you know that he's heard you. So help him to be open and receptive to that. So." Um, trying to help them spot the changes that they're making and probably quite a lot of reframing to, to, to put it in the most positive light so that they see, you know, that the light on the, at the end of the tunnel has been switched back on, if you like, you know, that hope is reawakened and that there is a chance for their relationship. The vast majority of people who come to me stay together. Um, the vast majority. Um, I sometimes wonder whether that's a good thing. You know, I sometimes see them again four years later. I think, oh, maybe they should have split up, you know. Right, okay, okay, yeah. But, but the vast majority do stay together. Yeah, well, I mean, and that, 
what are your expectations for a couple that comes into therapy? Like, how good can it get? Or is that a bit of a crazy question? No, I think it's a very good question. And I think some people come looking for... You and I did a, a, another webinar, which was about my book, The Landscapes of the Heart. And in that, I talked about the three phases of relationships, the ideal, the ordeal, and the real deal. And um, some people are hoping to get back to that, <coughs> excuse me, that ideal phase where it's all romantic love and... But actually, that's not very practical. Um, and most people come to couple therapy when they're in the ordeal phase, when they're having the power struggles and they're trying to work out, you know, who should be doing what in terms of jobs and, and responsibilities in the house and everything. Um, and actually, what I'm wanting to do is help them move along that to get to what we call the real deal, which is a very sweet relationship where you're working together you're in harmony together. You kind of know what to expect of each other. There's a, it's, it's a very sweet quality of relationship when you get to the real deal. The sad thing is that none of us stay there, and I include myself in this. Okay. Um, you know, you stay in the real deal for a bit, and then something happens, and you go back into the um, ordeal, which is the struggle and the frustration and the uh, phase. But my job is to keep you know, helping people move through again to get to the real deal again. So I think relationships can be very, very sweet and that we all deserve a good enough sex life and a good enough relationship. And if people are willing to work on themselves and willing to be honest with themselves, an awful lot can be done to rebuild relationships that even when people think this is past the point of no return and there's nothing I can do to get back, um, Often there is, and often people can recover something in their relationship. Yeah, I think that's really helpful and hopeful. Mm. Yeah, and some of our own expectations about relationships are going to be in the work, I guess. So, absolutely, and I think that that's one of the jobs of a couple therapist is to hold the hope. So, I am holding the hope that this is possible, whilst also giving permission for them to split up if they need to. So I'm in a very interesting place myself in that I was married. I was married for 12 years and actually separating from him was probably the best thing that happened to me. And I went on a huge personal journey myself after we separated, sort of as a, it was happening before, but it blo I blossomed as soon as we'd separated. And so I know that, and I'm in a very different kind of relationship now that is a very sweet, loving marriage. But I also know that the literature says, literature says, and I completely believe this, that most couples or most people split up from their first relationship and then get into the same dynamic again and keep redoing that again and again. And they live the same seven to ten years over and over and over again with a different partner even though they think they've chosen someone completely different actually they've chosen the same again so i hold that knowledge that for most people actually working on their relationship is the best thing they can do and for me splitting up was absolutely the best thing i could do it was my husband's decision i it was not my decision i was completely committed to the marriage but he said i'm out of here i'm you know i'm leaving and it was just, oh, I mean, bless him. Thank you so much. <laughs> he gave you a real gift, Juliet. So, 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 you know, knowing those two different ways of being is really helpful to me as a couple therapist because I'm not attached to people staying together, nor am I thinking that splitting up is a good thing. I think most people can work it out and staying together is good, but people need to split. So it, it kind of gives me a freedom. And I used to think I knew who were the ones who'd stay together and who the ones who weren't, and I absolutely don't. I never know. And that's very freeing because I now can just say, well, maybe you will and maybe you won't. I don't know. I don't, and I don't need to know. Yes, like you, you're not attached to the outcome and you know you can't predict it either. Exactly. Yes, <laughs> a, a humbling experience. Exactly, 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 yeah. exactly. I want... Well, the time is going so quickly. There's only 20 minutes and there's lots, there's more questions from colleagues. Okay. Some things that we had in the blurb and uh, there's maybe some other things that you're thinking about just now. Um, 
Well, one thing I thought I'd just tell you, because I think this is quite interesting, the, um, the statistics for having an affair, um, when you look at it online, they kind of say 60% of men have affairs and 40% of women have affairs. That's kind of an online thing. Um, I think YouGov um, uh, did the thing and they said, now where have I got it? I wrote it down this morning somewhere. Anyway, it was 10% or something they said had affairs. Um, we have a, a confidential questionnaire that we ask all the therapists who come to us. 71% of the therapists attending my workshops have had affairs. Ah, okay. 71%. So we're higher than the general population in terms of having affairs. And that's now a couple of hundred people that I've asked. Yes, that's so fascinating. That's kind of interesting. Um, yes. And do you have a gender split on that? No, I don't oh, ask so about... Although, yeah, no, I don't. I don't. I don't. Yes. That is fascinating, yes. Um, in terms of, I think, what we said in the blurb, we, I said I'd talk a little bit about unconditional love. I, I don't know if this is controversial or not, but I don't believe that partners should be expected to give unconditional love. I believe that um, we have the right to expect our partner to treat us with a certain amount of dignity or respect or whatever, and that when there's severe domestic violence or when there's severe, fi severe financial um, abuse or any abuse really of any, any kind, that we have the right to say that's the end of the line as far as I'm concerned and I'm, I'm not staying here. So I think parents should give their children unconditional love and that that should be, you know, even if your child is a murderer or whatever they've done, you should love them. But that with our partners, actually love is conditional. And if I behave in a certain way, I can expect for my partner not to hang around. So that goes against the marriage vows, which is till death I till death us do part. But um, yes. own kind of personal sense, I just think that's more realistic. Um, that for the majority of us, it's not going to be unconditional. Occasionally, I do something and I expect to get make my partner angry, my husband angry, and he's not angry and he gives me unconditional love. That's beautiful when it happens, but I can't expect it. I can't expect it as a matter of course. Yes. Well, and that's an interesting thing for us to hold because unconditional positive regard is often a part of the therapeutic space mm. that we're trying to offer, especially for those of yeah. us in the humanistic yeah. modality. So we might automatically and think that, well, that should be in the couple's relationship yeah. that we're working with. But yeah. and, and I separate behavior and identity too. So um, who you are and what you do are two different things. So you can be a really good person but do a bad thing, such as have an affair if you're related to me, and we have a contract that you won't do that um, and that you'll be monogamous, then that's a bad thing. Um, uh, one of the things just to mention in passing is, of course, nowadays relationships vary hugely in terms of sexuality of course we have you know all of that lesbian gay relationships but also twosomes threesomes uh polyamory and all of that so we cover that on the on the courses as well because if you're um what they know as a vanilla um uh person in other words pretty straight and like your sex fairly straight then and conventional then some of the ways that people decide to live their lives these days will be quite shocking. And you kind of have to get used to that idea and be ready for that to come into the room. You know, you might get a couple who are practicing sadomasochistic sex or something. Um, so you kind of need to be slightly ready for that. Um, well, that's a real definite example of where training is really helpful because yeah. like our posture might exclude some of the couple's experience from yes. the therapy room. Yeah, 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 absolutely. So, and of course, I work with sex offenders. Um, in the, that's, that's, so that's, that's one group that bypasses my uh, filter, um, and, and I see them as well. And, you know, so unconditional positive regards and sex offenders. I unconditionally positively regard who they are, but I certainly don't what they did. So separating out the behavior and the identity is really important in those kinds of instances. Yeah. 
And that would be the same with the couple. Like they might still really regard their partner, but they decide to leave them. Is yes, that... yes, 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 yes. Yeah, I think that's very fair. That you can love them, and 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 yes, and see them as a good being, but choose not to live with their behaviour. Absolutely. Right. Yes. Yes. Yeah. Well, you, you also in the blurb talked about codependency, and I think that's really interesting in the couple because a couple can look like they're really close, but actually the way that they're close is not helping either of them. No, that's right. So there's a really interesting model. Um, David Schnarch writes about this, and um, and I also write about it in my book, uh, Landscapes of the Heart, and and. Um, it's called differentiation. So differentiation is actually a term from biology where one cell uh, forms the soft pad on my finger here and another cell forms the hard nail on my finger and another cell is my kidney cell and another cell is my heart cell. And all of these cells are living within the system of my body and they are completely themselves doing their own job living in the system of my body. So how can I be in a relationship where I am completely myself, Juliet, but living in the system of the relationship that I have with my husband, William? And how can I let him be himself without trying to squash him, which is tempting sometimes, okay. to him, or make him behave in a certain way? Mm. Or, um, so, so that's one kind of set of behaviors that we try and control our partner. Another set of behaviors is to... Um, just comply, you know, okay, well, I'll just fit in. I'll be the one that gets up at five o'clock in the morning and takes you to the airport. I'll do everything for you and I'll just comply and I'll be the good one. And if I'm good enough, then maybe you'll love me. And um, so, so, so that's the compliant one. And then the third way of behaving is to distance oneself and to become like a kind of a lone wolf so that you're in the relationship allegedly but actually, you're not emotionally present to the relationship. So it's kind of like a, a, a distancing. And then the fourth one is to what we call differentiate, which is to actually manage to hold the two diverting or different um, ends of emotional connection and autonomy. So these are like two ends on a, on a spectrum. How can I have really good emotional connection and be autonomous? And that's the process of differentiation. So differentiation is like an overarching umbrella that sits above those two. And we talk a lot about that on the courses. Every module, or almost, almost every module, has a good chunk of that work because it's very simple, but it's not easy. It's, 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 it's not complex, but I find it so hard to get my head around it and to live it, to be me, and not to either try and, you know... So I heard William, this is a few years ago now, but I remember him getting really angry on the phone with a council worker and thinking, you can't treat people like that. And then realizing actually this was a moment where I had to let him do it his way and me do it my way. And most people, or many people, take their partner's behavior personally. And I had to say to myself, how he behaves with this council worker, that's his responsibility and it's a reflection on him, it's not a reflection on me. Right, yes, yes. And, and so, when, so another example, a different example, is when my partner doesn't want sex with me, that may, not, that may be a reflection on them, that may not be a reflection on me. So, you know, separating out myself from them and being fully in my own shoes and keeping the emotional connection, that for me is the art of a relationship. And that is the life dance that we're constantly, you know, I'm constantly struggling with greater closeness. My, my um, core place is absolutely to be codependent and emotionally fused. Yeah. To learn how to give my partner the space that he needs has been a real journey for me. And he really has taught me a lot about that. And his journey has been to have a really good emotional connection. And, and, and so we name it and we call each other when that, that line is getting stretched too far or too close. So or too close, yes. And so, uh, go on. Like in, in the training, I guess, the, the colleagues who come on the training are 
we're probably all struggling with that and that's something yes. to be working Absolutely. with in our own lives Absolutely. too, not just... Absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. That makes and sense. I, as a therapist, used to, when I first started out in therapy in 1991, I used to very much reassure my clients and build their egos up and, and, and sort of manage how they were feeling and, and try and reduce their discomfort. And I'm very different as a therapist now. I now see my job as helping them master their anxiety. So uh, my job is not to reduce their anxiety. My job is to help them face the anxiety of, if I say this, my partner might leave me. Yes, he might. Let's say it anyway and find out. Because if you don't say it, you're not being honest. And if you do say it, chances are your partner might respect you. So even when they don't like what you're saying, it's probably more likely to build respect than anything else. So helping clients to overcome their codependent anxiety that says, I can't possibly do this, um, and, and helping them get a stronger sense of themselves that lets them know they're going to survive whatever happens. And that brings the respect back in very often. So that, that, that's a delicate dance. And to me, that's the codependent dance. That's the emotional fusion differentiation dance. And as I say, that's threaded through every workshop because it's so cool to working with couples. And for me as a therapist to get my own sense of strength and my own sense of myself so that I can challenge my clients because otherwise therapists do what I did in the early days, which is just to build their ego and make them feel good about themselves. Yes. It doesn't help them in the long term. Yeah, so there can also be something about our codependency in our relationship with our clients. Absolutely. I Absolutely. noticed that shifting in my own work, starting out very much in the being alongside and validating the client and becoming, as the years go by, more more challenging and open yes. to yes. Let's see yes. what we can do. And yes, yes. I really like how you articulate that, like helping the client manage the anxiety so that they can do that. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. So I really think as a couple therapist, one of the things I'm doing is I'm helping them get a clear sense of themselves. Okay. I'm helping them manage their own anxiety. I'm helping them to not be overreactive to their partner's reactivity. So when their partner goes off on one, they stay grounded and balanced. And I'm helping them tolerate discomfort in order to grow. So... And that might be things like that, the discomfort of speaking up and saying what they need to say in order that they can grow and their partners can grow. So. Yeah. yeah. Thank you for that list, Julia. I think that's really helpful to encapsulate what you're up to as a couples mm. therapist and, mm. and what colleagues can get a hold of as they're to come to the training. And mm. yeah. yeah, We've got some... We've got about five minutes left and we've got six questions. I don't, I don't think we're going to get through those questions, okay. but maybe okay. we can do, see what we can get through before we have to come to an end. Would that be all right with okay. you? Okay. Um, a colleague asking if you've ever had a client wanting to give you, to, wanting you to give a report to a solicitor if they decided to divorce or for any other reason, like being drawn into a legal process. So I haven't had that for a divorce, never been asked for that for a divorce. I have been asked it by a sex offender who's a, um, appearing in court. And then I don't do a report, but I'll write a letter to say they've had so many sessions of therapy and engaged well. And so it's just a brief letter, but I haven't ever been asked for it for um, a divorce, no. Okay. Thank you, Juliet. And what do you think about sensate focus homework? Sensate focus is where the couples start by, um, so it's, it's where there's, for instance, if a man has an erection problem or a woman has a loss of desire, you might ban sex completely so that you take the pressure off the performance anxiety and get them touching and stroking each other. So for maybe 10 minutes, he strokes her and then for 10 minutes, she strokes him everywhere except where a boob tube would go and a pair of shorts would go. So not, nothing in the genital area. So you're reintroducing touch. Because when one of you's gone off sex, what often happens is that touch goes out the window because there's an anxiety. If I let him hug me, he's going to want to have sex with me. Or if I let her hug me, she's going to want to have sex with me. 
So um, sensate focus, that's what sensate focus is. And you gradually reintroduce the genitals and then move it on to full sex. So completely banning sex and reintroducing touch can be very, very helpful. And it's amazing how many couples come in saying, I know you banned sex last time, but we broke the ban. And suddenly, without the pressure of being allowed to have sex, his erections worked, they've decided to use it. And in those instances, a part of me wanted them to break the ban. So a part of me, great, you've had good sex, that's good. And then a part of me said, okay, but don't break it this week, you know, because I don't want to um, uh, bypass that effective thing of taking, removing the performance anxiety. So, yes. Yes. Um, so I think sensate focus can be really useful, and it's one of the skills as, as a sex therapist. That's really helpful, Juliet. Thank you. Yes. And I like hearing about your internal reaction to that. Too. <laughs> Very nice. Um, a colleague wondering, how do you assess whether there is a need for each of the couple to also have individual therapy? Because I guess you don't ask for that with everyone? Or? No, I don't ask for that with everyone. It becomes clear. <clears throat> it becomes clear that one of them may be holding, for example, she might be holding an awful lot of grief around an abortion that she had or before they got together or there may be some issue from childhood that is clearly... Um, impinging on the adult relationship or even not impinging there's you know there's there's work to be done um, on the childhood issues and so it just becomes clear and, and when it does then <clears throat> generally I suggest that they both go off and have one-to-one -one sessions um, um, no I don't know I just know when when a childhood issue is, is coming up and I feel it's going to take too much time out of the couple therapy to do it in the couple therapy work then I'll send them off individually yeah yeah that makes sense yeah thank you Juliet that's really helpful um, a question about if one of the partners decides to drop out of the contracted number of sessions they've agreed to so I guess uh, one of the couple isn't managing to keep going usually so i've never had that happen so firstly um usually one person is bringing the other person so usually um one is coming more willingly and one is coming more reluctantly um so that's a, a very typical thing and then you have to work with the reluctant one and, and help them to see what would make it worth your while being here so i say to people we're never going to go back to the relationship you had that's gone but let's create a new relationship that's going to work well enough for both of you that you actually want to stay together. So that's what I'm aiming for. Um, and I also say until one or both of you decides you really want to separate and then I'll help you to do that with dignity. Hmm. That's my kind of little spiel, if you like. Um, so as uh, if it were me, Juliet, and one of them decides not to come, then I would talk to the other one about whether they want to keep going and stay in therapy or not. If it was a new therapist who was newly starting, I would say that I would suggest that they say, well, that's the end of our contract. If one of you stops, then that, that, that's the end of the contract of our couple therapy. So we cease couple therapy. Um, so I think that depends on the level of experience of, yeah. the, of the therapist, how I'd advise you handle that one. But it's never happened to me. Yes, yeah, and it makes sense about the contract. It does, and uh, maybe there's something about that like if both people who are both people in the couple can feel the freedom to do what they need to do, even if that's to separate, then that maybe allows more energy for staying in. Yeah. Yes. And I definitely one of the questions I ask is in certain situations with certain couples is, well, why don't you leave? Why, you know, let's think about leaving. What would that be like? Because as you say, it can often have a paradoxical impact of helping them to realise what they might lose and recognise that actually they'd really like to stay together. Yes, yes. One last question on differentiation. Do you have any good references, people that colleague might read, colleagues might read around codependency, differentiation? And if nobody's coming to mind right now, that's, that's also... So there's two, there's two books. One is Landscapes of the Heart, The Working World of a Sex and Relationship Therapist. Yeah. by an interesting person called Juliet Grayson. 
And the other one is um, that I really would recommend is um, David Schnarch, and that's spelled S C H N A R C H. And his the best book I think, or the most readable book that he's written, is called Intimacy and Desire. Um, so I would recommend that one as a good uh, emotional, a good book on emotional fusion and differentiation. So it is codependence, but he doesn't call it codependence. But that's what he's talking about. That's great. That's very impressive, Juliet, that you've gone non-stop for an hour and, and you've also got some... <laughs> That's a very, very good film. Very okay. impressed. There's one last question that I wanted to ask you. Maybe I can slip in. And whether you've worked with couples online or do you do all your couple work face-to-face? -face? I have had the odd couple who I've seen over Skype um, but the vast, vast, vast majority, I'm in a very um, fortunate position that I actually have a waiting list at the moment, so I can dictate my terms and people kind of agree. Um, so uh, the vast, 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 vast majority um, work face to face with me. Um, and I do prefer it because it lets you feel the energy in the room. But I'm always amazed at how much you can do online, you know, and how real this is and how helpful it is. and. You know, a real sense of you sitting there and it, it, it's, you know, it does feel almost as good as face to face. Yeah. So, um, but I, I, it's not my area of expertise. Yes. And it makes sense what you're saying about being able to feel the energy of the couple because there's a real feeling around that come around the relationship, not just the individuals. Yeah. yeah and sometimes with a complex couple, you know, they're. So I've got a couple who I work with and, and, and I've been working with them for a while and I think of this as being the place where she's really ready to engage with him and they do this. So when he's ready to engage with her, she's not ready. And when she's ready to engage with him, you know, and honestly, if I had them over Skype, it would just be too complex for me to be able to pick up that dynamic because what happens is one comes forward and the other withdraws and then I get this one to creep forward, but this one's with, you know, it's really, yeah. um, they are they are an interestingly challenging couple, but um, I, 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 so I think some couples you can work with Skype and it's fine, and other couples I would find too challenging to work with Skype. Yeah, like having, in, having them in the room makes all the difference, yeah. Yeah, yeah, still challenging with them in the room, but it's more manageable. <laughs> <laughs> yes, okay. Well, thank you for that honesty too, Julia. I really appreciate it. And it feels like a very full hour. Thank you very much for everything that you brought. Mm. It. Um, I think it feels like a really great preview of the training that you offer and lots of great learning um, for colleagues who are not coming on the training, but who are either doing the work or you're interested. Um, I, I can see there's a few more comments on Facebook from people who are doing your training and saying it's amazing. So that's also thank you. Thank you. Nice. And people saying how much they've enjoyed listening. So yeah. thank you to everybody who's joined us live. If you've been typing away, that's been great too. Watching in the library, thank you for your presence. And Juliet, thank you again for, for a great, great art.